you know, my generation, that includes Ron Vittori and I, uh, we were a little technically challenged. So um, I spoke with him uh, earlier today and spoke with him yesterday, and he's been having trouble logging in. So he's going to try by telephone, and Ashley said he, uh, she talked to him for a second, and then he got cut off. So uh, we will keep trying there. Uh, he is my generation, you know, because Ron, Vittori, and I share daughters uh, the same age. I don't know if, if many of you heard the story, but uh, when the DuPage Railroad Safety Council reached out to ask Administrator Vittori to be at our 2018 conference, he accepted. And uh, we were just so thrilled that here's the chief railroad safety officer in the whole country uh, is going to join us at the DuPage Railroad Safety Council's conference. Uh, little did, did I realize at the time that uh, Administrator Batore knew my story and the story of the DuPage Railroad Safety Council quite well. You see his daughter Erin and my daughter Lauren were in the same class at Hinsdale Central High School in 1994, the year that my daughter Lauren died. And uh, Aaron, his daughter, was angry at her father who was working in the railroad industry and, uh, and her, her friend Lauren had died. Um, so um, he has watched the DuPage Railroad Safety Council grow through the years and uh, so it was wonderful to have him with us in 2018 and uh, to have him back again today. I feel confident that we'll make that connection before the time is, is finished. We've got about 15 minutes. Um, we might uh, have to have uh, Leon, administrator. I've got, I've got him on speaker now. He's listening to you and he's able to share. So <laughs> oh, wonderful. Welcome. Welcome, Administrator Batori. How are you today, sir? Uh, good, good, mor good morning, Lanny. Can you hear me? We sh I sure can. I sure can. Welcome okay. aboard. I hear, some, uh, I hear some background noise. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, um, it's I, just. I, I certainly apologize for the issue concerning Zoom. Um, much uh, to my surprise, I didn't expect to have this difficulty because I've used it quite frequently. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ron, I, I was just explaining to the group that uh, our generation, yours and mine, has a little bit of trouble with some of this technical stuff. And I was saying that uh, we are the same generation because we have daughters the same age. Okay. And. Uh, so anyway, welcome aboard. If you if you um, if you'll allow me, Ron, I'm going to go ahead and and read your your bio. I think it uh, it's worthy of spending the time, and uh, you've accomplished so much in your uh, lifetime. You know, uh, Ronald L. Batori is a career professional with more than 45 years of field and system experience in the railroad industry. He spent the first 23 years of his career working for both Eastern and Western Class I railroads, in addition to serving along with a court appointed trustee's successful oversight of a regional railroad bankruptcy. Then in 1994, the year that, that Lauren died, he was appointed president of the Belt Railway Company of Chicago, a multiple owned subsidiary of then nine competing Class I carriers. His leadership success of serving their needs in Chicago Gateway led to CSX and Norfolk Southern Corporation later recruiting him to Consolidated Rail Corporation in preparation of their STB approved part partitioning of Eastern Carrier and establishing what is now commonly known as the shared assets, assets area. Accomplishment of that unique task in providing a plane of equality for joint competition later favored him in being appointed to his last position of president and chief operating officer for the entire corporate entity. Upon his retirement in 2017, he pursued public service in Washington, D.C., which resulted in a presidential nomination and unanimous consent by the United States Senate to become the 14th 
Administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration. Ron is a graduate of Adrian College, Adrian, Michigan, with a BA degree along with an MA degree from Eastern Michigan University. He has served on various governing boards associated within the sectors of both industry and education. Ron's residence is in Santa Fe, New Mexico with his lovely wife, Barbara. Welcome aboard, Administrator. Glad you could make it. Good morning, Lanny and everyone. Um, it's certainly a, an honor to, to address all of you. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yes, um, you're coming in. I work, I use Zoom and uh, I won't address myself as being an expert in technology, but <laughs> up until this morning, Zoom has favored me quite well, but um, I'm out in the western part of the United States and it's been hard to connect with Zoom and uh, be able to be privy to seeing many of you on this call. Um, let me uh, share, share with you a couple remarks um, about rail safety and that in particular associated with rail highway grade crossing safety as well as the growing dilemma that we're faced with with um, rail trespassing. With uh, the overall railroad industry this year, um, all of the areas that are continually addressed by the industry in so far as injuries, death, derailments, grade crossing accidents, um, as well as um, trespassing, the, it is encouraging to see um, that the industry continues to trend favorably, uh, still using the same common denominators. So one can't necessarily take exception and say, well, because of the pandemic, there's less exposure. Um, the industry is doing well in so far as minimizing the amount of incidents that occur that drives the variability into the system, but more so the loss of, of life and injury that can result from those incidents. Um, with trespassing, it continues to grow throughout the country um, with or without suicide involvement. And it's something that we have to address and figure out a better answer to it. It's certainly a, um, a subject matter that has grown dramatically in the past decade in relationship to what I can reflect over the, the previous uh, decades of my involvement in the industry. And it's, and it's the passion that's shown by all of you on this call today and in, the, in this conference that will help us identify a path going forward or paths, perhaps in the plural of trying to find a resolve in not only reducing trespasser incidences, but eliminating them. The same holds true nationally for grade crossing accidents, but there's been so much accomplished over the past decades. But again, as we often say, one life is one life too many, one incident is one incident too many. We still have lots of work to do. And although we have some new tools in our tool bag, especially associated with technology, um, we can't just sit back and wait for technology to become the, the silver bullet, if you will, because it never will. The real issue at hand is communication and awareness and compliance. And that resides with each of us individually. And that's something that we have to instill into everyone's minds, no different than when they get in that, an automobile and they put on their seatbelt today. Um, that was a long journey unto itself. But, uh, um, we now have, if you will, at FRA, a multi-year plan for railway grade safety uh, as well as trespasser safety. And that plan is 
if you will, addressed as a living document. It's led by Jim Payne in Washington, D.C. He maintains it, um, utilizing the resources within FRA, all the state inspectors, all the various councils and groups such as your own, as well as representatives at NHTSA and the Highway Department. So we are very encouraged with the results that we're seeing from that. Um, and it, we continue to emphasize the need for ongoing strong communication when it comes to this whole issue of awareness and compliance. Um, Seems like we must have just lost him. My my apologies. Um, that happens, and uh, you you all can see uh, and hear from his passion and his commitment. Um, what a great leader we have in we administration. Got him back. <laughs> Are we back? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I got disconnected. Sure. Welcome back. Uh, Lanny, can you still hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. You're doing great. Uh, okay, I apologize because I'm getting an excessive amount of feedback. Uh, but with, with that, I, I'm most honored uh, by the council as well as the, the Wilson family's influence um, insofar as presenting the plaque. I have it with me. Uh, oh, good. I uh, am most, most honored. Okay. To, to be a recipient of that, that award. Um, I, I heard Lan Lanny talk about the unfortunate day when he and his wife's son and, and daughter um, were involved in the train auto crash in Hinsdale, Illinois, where they lost their daughter. And um, as Lanny said, Aaron and his daughter were in high school together. Um, the crossing that happened at um, was one I was very familiar with, uh, with Triple Track, uh, Burlington Northern Railroad at the time. Um, I remember not only being an area resident, but at the time when I was earlier working for Southern Pacific, uh, we operated about 12 trains a day across that crossing. So when I heard about the incident, I swallowed hard, not <clears throat> because uh, we heard about it on the media before I heard anything about it from the dispatcher's office. And then later learned about the tragedy and how close it was to my daughter. And um, everything Lanny shared with you was uh, right on, on that. It was a very quiet evening at dinner that night um, about the incident. So there was a lot of lessons learned as there always is of anything that's tragic. Uh, that one in particular, uh, much was learned from. And then naturally Lanny and was, took the initiative of creating the council. And uh, I was very cognizant of it when I was residing in Chicago. And then later, uh, you know, 20, basically uh, 20 years later plus, uh, I found myself in Washington at the FRA, and he and I have crossed paths for the first time. And um, we've maintained a relationship ever since and continue to maintain one going forward. But Lanny, thank you to, your, to you, your wife, all your colleagues and friends that, that champion what you uh, do every day in so far as trying to create a safer environment okay for, for not only the motoring public but the pedestrians uh whenever they come in proximity of of, of railroad property um i did uh, share with you that uh, i'm certainly amenable to uh any questions uh that you or the audience may have and i'll um try to field them and again i uh if i'm not coming across well, I apologize, but I have absolutely no idea why I'm hearing this feedback on this call. Administrator Pretori, uh, we're just so happy that you joined us today. 
uh, we can uh, field those questions at a, at a later time. I think the audience can see that we're blessed to have an administrator with such a big heart. And one of the reasons why you've received the award that you have, sir, is because you're a good listener. We had some high school students at our last monthly meeting who told us about getting an audience with the administrator. And uh, so you, uh, you're a, a real genuine person. You're, you're not just sitting in a high loft uh, above the rest of the crowd. You could have easily retired when you finished um, uh, in, in public life, but you, you've given your, your time uh, and we're so honored that you've given your time and so thankful that you've given your time to help uh, serve as administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration. You're a great listener, you've got a great heart and uh, many generations to come uh, lives will be saved because of the changes in attitude that you've brought in your time at the FRA. So thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for your service, sir. Right. Thank you, Lanny, and thank you all that are in attendance today. And I look forward to future opportunity when we can meet again. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you, Administrator. Administrator Ron Vittori, we're so fortunate to have him uh, be our administrator. Next panel uh, is going to be led by an FRA uh, uh, member, Michael Griskevich. I practiced long and hard, Mike, to get your last name right. Since 2004, Mike has been a part of the Federal Railroad Administration's Office of Railroad Safety as a Railroad Trespassing Program Specialist. He partners with federal, state, and local government officials throughout the United States to establish and implement trespass prevention programs. Mike led the development of the National Strategy to Prevent Trespassing on Railroad Property Document and oversees the implementation of the strategies outlined. Without further ado, here's Mike. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, and thank you everyone that has joined us today to uh, uh, learn more and discuss strategies on this very important topic. As Administrator Batori said, the Federal Railroad Administration under his direction has created a national strategy outlining FRA's position and our milestones or tasks that we would like to um, see happen over the next several years. FRA is technically two years into that national strategies and of the 20 that are listed um, in this document, FRA has uh, tackled 18 of them, and the other two are more of a long-term effects or long-term projects that FRA will continue to work on. You'll see that pop up in the chat room. You'll see a link to that document. Feel free to contact us. That, that will be a great uh, resource for folks in the audience. In addition to that, as uh, my friend and colleague Steve Laffey mentioned earlier, since 2012 to 2019, there has been over 10,000 casualties related to railroad trespassing. That does include trespassing casualties and suicide casualties combined. Of that, over 4,000 fatalities and over 3,900 injuries since 2012. So conferences or summits like this is a very important gathering. Over the next hour or so or, or shortly, we're gonna talk about strategies for eliminating rail suicides. I'm, it's my pleasure today that I'm joined by three experts in the field, Dr. April Foreman, Dr. Star Kitta, and Michelle Jennings of Amtrak. Um, these three folks are outstanding in their fields. All three of them will provide you some very valuable information and all these presentations that you will see from these three folks will be made available um, after the program on the websites. So let's get right into it. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. April Foreman, PhD. She is a licensed psychologist serving veterans as a deputy director of the Vicerans Veterans Crisis Line Innovation Hub. She's also the executive community member for the Board of American Association of Suicidology and have served at the VA since 2017. Um, for me, I'm very pleased to introduce her to speak today as a veteran. It's nice to see the uh, VA tackle this issue and have somebody esteemed as uh, Dr. Foreman leading this cause. Dr. Foreman, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, 
what a what a delight to be here. Uh, I am not uh, speaking on uh, behalf of VA. I'm here in my um, AAS board member capacity, but the VA knows that I do these things, and and certainly uh, is is happy for me to be here in, in my in my sort of broader professional capacity. Uh, I'm here to talk about suicidology, uh, which can I tell you makes me the most popular person at every house party uh, I ever go to. But I'm hoping to start by telling you a story. Um, and I'm trying to advance to the slides. Maybe Ashley, if you could go ahead and advance forward. Perfect. So I get to travel a lot and talk to all sorts of folks uh, about suicidology and suicide prevention. And one time, uh, I sort of last minute found myself in uh, Rotterdam and I uh, was suddenly having uh, drinks and waffle with a lovely uh, gentleman who was um, the suicide prevention uh, director for the um, Netherlands uh, railway system. And of course, this was my first time talking with someone who specialized in rail uh, related suicide prevention. And I, you know, of course, was so curious to learn how things were going to learn all about it. And he said that in the Netherlands, they're really committed to a zero incident safety culture and suicide prevention and rail safety just really go hand in hand with this. Um, I, I had a wonderful evening. Uh, and then of course, just a few months later, uh, so this was, um, I wanna say maybe maybe six months later, uh, you can see in the Netherlands Times that suicide deaths by train were down 10%, which is the biggest decrease in a decade. So this is what this gentleman's office was able to achieve. When it comes to preventing suicide deaths, um, there can be a real sense of, of hopelessness, helplessness, or uh, a real myth, a misperception that if people want to die, there's nothing you can do to stop them. The data uh, is the absolute opposite of that, which is that just like any other safety culture, good design reduces death. And most people who are suicidal don't die and go on to recover. So if you can, intervene in a relatively short period of time, making the environment a little safer, people live. And this gentleman that I was having drinks and waffle with uh, at a place called Granny's in Rotterdam is, would definitely agree and tell all of us in America that this is possible. Next slide. So just very briefly, I'm Dr. April Foreman uh, and, and I am here for a reason. Um, my mission in life is to reduce pain uh, and it, one, I'll do it one person, one problem, one minute at a time if I have to, but I try to be more effective than that if I can. And I'm here today to help provide this community uh, with better education about suicidology and suicide prevention so that we can advocate for things uh, that we need to prevent railway suicide deaths. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here with you. I'm happy to share my personal contact information. I like to have long relationships with folks because ultimately it is the general public advocating for what is needed that changes uh, the world and saves lives. Next slide, please. There are some real fundamentals that we uh, about the science of suicide uh, that it's really important for you to understand so that going forward, you can ask for what is needed to change these problems. And here are a few things. Suicidal feelings are temporary and they will not kill you. No one ever died from feeling suicidal. As a matter of fact, about eight to 9 million Americans will feel so intensely suicidal that they will be at high risk for suicide uh, this year. One or 2 million Americans will attempt suicide this year, but only maybe 50,000 or so will go on to die. And most people, if they have an interrupted suicide attempt, never go on to attempt again, and they go on to recover fully. And I mean, like well over 90%. So if you help somebody make it through that really, really bad time, or if you make the environment just a little bit safer, people just don't die and they do go on to recover. The suicide zone, that little period of time is not very long. As a matter of fact, on average, it's, it's only about 30 minutes where someone uh, appears to be in what uh, one of my favorite suicidologists, Dr. Bill Schmitz, calls a suicide zone. You are in an impaired state. You are almost never thinking clearly. You're, you have almost tunnel vision. You have really distorted thoughts. Uh, you think you, it, and, and you aren't thinking rationally. So you think that the world would be better off without you, that you're helping people by killing yourself. You can't problem solve well, and your thoughts are 
you know, they're funny and, and, and you, you uh, are acting impulsively and we need to do better science. We need to fund better science. So we understand what's happening in people's brains during this period. But the truth is, this is just very impaired functioning and it passes very quickly. It's not the feelings that kill you. So as much as we say, oh, this stressful thing happened or they felt bad, so they just had no choice but to kill themselves, those feelings pass. And it's what kills you are the actions that you take to end your life. So uh, when somebody dies by suicide, they, they feel that way, plus their environment has a, allows them access to something very lethal, such as being able to uh, walk in front of a train and die by impact or access to a firearm. Uh, so what we know is that the more lethal event that someone has access to during that very limited period of time, the more likely they are to not survive. And most people survive. So we just have to make things less dangerous. Lethal means restriction is what this is called. And this is really related uh, to uh, things that I think the railway system is very familiar with. So think about automotive safety. Suicides now kill more people than die in traffic accidents. That's not because suicide rates went up that much, but because traffic accident deaths went way down. Now, if you've ever watched me or my teenagers drive, you know it is not because humans are better at running cars. We made roads safer, we made cars safer, we enacted laws about seatbelts, we changed attitudes about designated drivers and driving while intoxicated. We did a lot of things so that more people survived traffic accidents than used to survive them before. And there is an approach in suicide prevention that should be very familiar to the folks in railway culture, which is the zero suicide or zero incident culture. We believe that we can reduce suicide deaths, not because people will always feel less suicidal, but because we can make environments less lethal. And one of the things that happened uh, in the Netherlands is they figured out a way to engineer more safe railway environments so that folks who were suicidal might be more likely to survive that moment and be less able to take a uh, quick impulsive action that's highly lethal to end their lives in that very limited period of time. Next slide, please. There are some other things that I believe that the railway system has going for it that could help us solve the problem of suicide, the blight of suicide in the United States. There are a couple of really big challenges in suicide prevention that we are facing that you might be able to advocate for help with. One is data. I saw a wonderful question in the chat about coroner data. And here the, here's the truth about coroner data. Coroner data is highly variable across the United States. There are huge um, variabilities in death investigators, in who is appointed as a coroner, and in their, their reporting technology. So when it comes to suicide deaths and death, inve death investigations, you have real variability in the kind of, kind of professional doing the investigation real variability in their training. And you have folks who may literally be using carbon copied forms on a manual typewriter versus folks using highly um, sophisticated computer databases. And all of that has to go into something called the National Vi uh, Violent Death Reporting Index. And it takes two years for us to get all that data and get it cleaned enough to use. And the CDC only has uh, now nine, it was at the start of this year, six, now nine people working on that data, but suicide data often comes about two years after. Uh, we are usually dealing with data from two years ago, not currently. So you're dealing with railways, just like with traffic, you might have access to data about suicide deaths in your railway systems and more information about the root cause of those deaths than us suicidologists have about suicide deaths. And maybe, maybe we can work on sharing. Additionally, Railway systems are systems. That means that you know a lot about what's happening around the lethal means, the impact from the train. Uh, you know a lot more about what's happening and can control the environment a lot more. While we definitely see public campaigns, and I'm, and I'm on the committees that design those campaigns, that say everybody can prevent suicide, just reach out, talk to someone who cares, and that's a very loving and wonderful thing to do. I have never known one single in human intervention to as reliably change death numbers as a well-designed system. We can do something about railway suicide deaths largely because you have data and you have system changes. And that's something that even on a broad scale in public health, we're struggling with with this issue. Next slide, please. 
And I know I'm going super fast, but I'm hoping everyone's waking up. Uh, I know, uh, Lanny, uh, it has been an absolute pleasure to get to know the folks involved in, in this conference. And what I know um, from suicide and what I know about railway deaths now is that lost survivors are powerful advocates. We know that people who have survived a suicide death have lifetime increased risk for suicide deaths themselves and that they need um, they need special attention to their own health. Often, for example, if you have someone in your family who's died by cancer, you know something about your own risk and suicide is very similar. We also know that postvention, providing postvention programs for people who have survived a suicide death is very important. With railway uh, suicide deaths, you'll know who's died and you can outreach uh, the people who've survived. There is something called a loss team and these are teams that rapidly deploy and reach out to people who've survived a suicide death. And we know that postvention is prevention. So I would strongly encourage our survivor and, uh, survivors and, and advocates here to think about how you can build postvention into railway suicide death, uh, uh, railway suicide prevention planning. Next slide. I want to talk about not only going to Rotterdam, but I want to talk about going to China. Um, I, I, like I said, I'm so lucky I get to travel. And so I was speaking to epidemiologists in China about some of the interesting things uh, happening in the United States relative to suicide prevention. And my, I was a keynote and my co-presenter was a guy named Dr. Lars Mellum. This, you can see him in our slides right here. Dr. Lars Mellum is the president of the International Association for Suicide Research, and he runs epidemiology uh, and suicide research labs uh, for, the, for all of um, Norway. Uh, he and his wife, uh, who were just marvelous companions while we were in China. And one of the things that Lars really helped, you know, Lars and I talked about was the real power of zero suicide culture and the real power of data and science to change things. That we, that in, in, um, in Norway, where he was, they were having the same issues that we might see in the United States about suicide deaths. But for him, they had all the data about everyone who died and they had it faster and they could inform and design prevention responses just a little bit faster than us. Lars also is just a wonderful uh, reminder of how much you can do with partnerships and sharing information from country to country or system to system. And it's with that spirit of partnership that I leave you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Foreman. Um, very informative presentation and, and uh, um, we'll have to do another presentation for you to give us a uh, update on your trips uh, around the world as it relates to the suicide and the different types of programs that you have encountered. Uh, I'd like to introduce next uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Star Kitta. She is the division chief for FRA Human Factors Division in FRA's Office of Human Research, Development, and Technology. Since 2013, Star has supported her division's research in areas such as grade crossing safety, trespass and suicide prevention, EEG, and of course, safety culture. Star received her PhD in industrial organized psychology from the University of Georgia and her BS in psychology from Davidson College. Um, I can personally tell you Star is very well versed in this topic and um, as leading our human factors division, um, she is outstanding in her field. Um, Star, can you take it over? Absolutely. Thank you for that introduction and thank you Dr. Foreman for that great presentation. I think your remarks certainly help us begin to understand some of the complexities involved in this, this topic. Um, so earlier this morning, we've heard Steve Laffey give a comprehensive summary of fatalities, twin, fatalities trends. And Steve also explained the special challenge associated with rail suicide. We've also had the opportunity to hear from rail, from commuter rail carriers about some of the initiatives you guys are working on to reduce uh, trespassing and suicide incidents. So thank you for that. On to the next slide. I'm here on behalf of the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, at FRA, we understand that these issues that we've been talking about this morning are not something that are the responsibility of any one entity. It's not something railroad carriers can address on their own. Rather, these issues require thoughtful and consistent collaboration between all the stakeholders, which are railroad carriers, communities, 
law enforcement, educators, and mental health organizations. At FRA, we work in collaboration with the Volpe National Transportation System Center, Volpe. Um, you've had a chance to meet Scott Gabri this morning, and I know a number of you have worked with him in the past. Um, Scott is the lead researcher for rail suicide research prevention at FRA, and we're very grateful to have him on board. At FRA, we conduct three categories of suicide prevention activities, outreach, data analysis, and countermeasures support, countermeasures development and evaluation. Um, I'm going to really focus on our outreach efforts today. Next slide. So to highlight our rail suicide prevention outreach activities, I'll first talk about an existing working group, and then I'm going to offer an invitation to you all. Since 2013, FRA and Volpe have led an international working group of experts in rail suicide and trespass prevention. This group is called GRASP, the Global Railway Alliance for Suicide Prevention. The goal of GRASP is to gather information about the ongoing efforts that are being undertaken from experts around the world. We document lessons learned and best practices from our international rail partners, and the information we learn from this GRASP working group then informs our research activities at FRA and Volpe. On the slide here, you can see a link uh, with some more information about the GRASP working group. At this link, you can also find the meeting notes from all of our GRASP meetings. Next slide. GRASP meetings have provided us with lessons learned and best practices from countries such as Canada, the Netherlands, the UK, and Sweden. A few sample lessons learned from the GRASP working group include, first, the impacts of specific words and phrases on rail suicide. That is, what words or public messaging tactics can assist those who need to find help and which words may inadvertently highlight the lethality of rail suicide. Another strategy that we've heard frequently from our GRASP participants is training individuals to identify uh, specific behaviors that are indicative um, or that precede rail suicides and teaching individuals to intervene. So this is an example you've heard about the QPR training from Metra and other commuter rails that they employ. Another focus of many GRASP members is ridership engagement. We've heard some railroads choosing to ask their riders to keep, out for, keep a lookout for those that may be at risk and take action. And lastly, one last highlight from the GRASP working group We've heard that some countries are using intelligent CCTV systems. Um, we've heard that they use historic footage to understand the precursor behaviors associated with rail suicide. So what do people do before there's a suicide attempt? And we've also had carriers report that they use those intelligent CCTV systems to send an alarm to the train control system or to the train control center who can then decide on an action to take. Next slide. In August of this year, we had a GRASP meeting to specifically discuss the impacts of COVID-19. This was a unique opportunity for us to discuss the extent to which there were changes in the rate and or characteristics of suicide incidents during the COVID-19 pandemic. Across our GRASP participants, uh, our participants re uh, reported large reductions in ridership and most participants didn't anticipate a, no, a return to normal levels of ridership for years because of the big shifts to telework. Participants also reported a range of impacts on the rates and characteristics of trespass and suicide incidents. So for example, the UK saw an initial reduction in rail suicide, but that's since rebounded to normal levels. The Netherlands and Sweden are seeing numbers unchanged from last year, despite reductions in train movements. And in Toronto, they're seeing the highest number of suicides in 11 years over just the first six months of 2020. 
I encourage you all on this phone, on this call to review the meeting notes from this special meeting in August. There's a link posted here and feel free to reach out to us if you'd like more information or would like to discuss this further. Next slide. One of the most commonly applied strategies to prevent rail suicide worldwide is for trained staff to identify those at risk for suicide and intervene. In a COVID-19 world where in-person interactions are minimized, this was initially seen as, an, uh, as a risk uh, approaching other people. But nearly universally, our GRASP member countries decided that the benefit of these efforts outweighed the risks. Some countries pushed their training online or had the training in larger classrooms, but most have maintained training their employees during the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has prompted some concerns about potential increases in suicide related to job loss or isolation and real-time data is what rail, rail carriers can use to help identify trends and respond accordingly. At the last GRASP meeting in August, the US also shared information about a grant program that I'll discuss next. Next slide. So recently, FRA posted a notice of funding opportunity for organizations in the US to implement an outreach campaign for reducing rail suicide. We've reviewed the applications and made funding recommendations to our leadership at FRA. We received 22 eligible applications totaling $1.8 million of federal funding. And when you include the cost share that applicants have um, agreed to put up associated with these applications, the cost of these programs was 2.5 million. Now think about those dollar amounts in terms of what the FRA actually had available to provide. The FRA has a little less than $300,000 for this grant program. So what this is telling us is that the need for funding rail suicide prevention outreach efforts clearly outweighs the current level of funding, federal funding that we currently have to support them. So my colleagues and I, Mike G, uh, Scott Gabri, we're hoping to make it known to our leadership that FRA needs additional funds to help you guys implement these railroad suicide prevention efforts. Next, next slide. So lastly, I'd like to offer an invitation. Let's see. Yeah, I'd like to offer an invitation. Next slide on that. Yep. Um, we heard Hillary talk about Metra's Breaking the Silence event as an opportunity to share best practices. Um, building on the success of both that event and the GRASP working group, we at the FRA and the Volpe Center would like to start to develop a US-based railroad suicide prevention working group. We're currently in the very preliminary stages of developing this group. So on the screen here, you see the, point, the, the email addresses of the main points of contact for this initiative. So Scott Gabri and Stephanie Chase. The basic concept of this working group is to provide a forum similar to the GRASP working group, but for US commuter and passenger rail carriers. The forum would meet annually to discuss issues relevant to trespass and suicide prevention. And the goal is to share lessons learned and best practices among the railroad carriers who have experienced successes and challenges related to these issues. So again, if you're interested in finding out more of this, more about this very new initiative, uh, please reach out to Scott or Stephanie. Next slide. And lastly, here's the contact information for me and also my colleague, Scott Gabri, who you've heard on the phone. I encourage you guys to Take note of our phone numbers, our email addresses, and, and use that. Reach out to us. Scott and I are federal employees. We're public servants. We're here to work for you guys. So please let us know what we can do. With that, I will turn it back over to Mike G. Thank you, Star. 
Um, one thing I would like to add to Star's presentation that my colleagues will be posting for you is FRA, along with our friends at the Volpe Center, have created a um, uh, rail uh, suicide uh, resource page. Um, that link will be posted in the chat room for you. Um, as Dr. Kidder mentioned um, at FRA, we have um, several people focusing on this topic, uh, Dr. Blue, Monica Shaw, Francesco. Um, so there are several of us here to assist you. So visit that resource page, reach out to STAR, and please join our team. Um, the more people that join this team, the better that the impact that we'll have. The next presentation I'd like to get into is with um, Michelle Jennings. Michelle's a Geographical Informational Systems, GIS professional for Amtrak Police Department, Office of Intelligence and Analysis. She received her BA, BA in GIS from the University of Texas at Austin. Since 2000, she's worked at a variety of capacities as uh, in the public safety sector, supporting police, fire, and emergency operations. Um, Michelle's presentation, um, we'll get into an in-depth look at a prevention strategy that has been put into motion. So Michelle, can I turn it over to you? Thank you. Good morning. Um, it looks like I'll need some help uh, changing slides because I don't have the, um, the permission to do it. Um, yes, my name is Michelle Jennings. I work for the Amtrak Police Department. And as an analyst, um, in this department, I utilize GIS technology for intelligence-led policing and crime analysis. My presentation is about the impact of warning signs on the frequency of train strikes and uh, train-assisted suicides. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am passionate about this work and I hope to promote rail safety. To begin, let me introduce the Amtrak system. Our routes span throughout the country, but we only own the rails in the Northeast Corridor. That is a lot of territory, and with only 400 uh, sworn officers in the Amtrak Police Department, we must utilize our resources, resources as effectively as possible. The modern police agencies today favor using a philosophy called intelligence-led policing. This philosophy allows police departments to utilize data and information in order to better evaluate crime trends. This allows decision makers to efficiently and effectively allocate resources and develop crime fighting strategies that better reflect temporal and spatial crime trends. I like to think of it as being proactive rather than reactive. For example, in this map, I'm analyzing a specific type of crime in California and it's displayed in three ways by most frequent train station, geographical hotspot, and most frequent Amtrak route. These types of maps are used to deploy our police officers intelligently and more efficiently to reduce crime. We don't wanna waste our limited resources, resources in stations and route segments where, um, for instance, are less likely to occur. In addition to routes, we also look for patterns by identifying hotspots within our major stations. We analyze crime with spatial and temporal patterns at our major stations to plan out our deployment strategies. On this map, recommendations are made for specific train rides to intervene continual crime patterns in the California area. But rail strikes can be analyzed in the same way. I started mapping out strikes back in 2016 and analyzed them much the same way I analyze crime. I mapped them out categorize the strikes, I rank the geographic areas, and analyze strikes over time. I ran ESRI's space-time cube analysis geoprocessing tool and found that, in fact, our top strike locations are indeed true hotspots over space and time. There's a real pattern happening here over an extended amount of time. The consecutive hotspots um, for Amtrak include the California Bay Area and the San Diego area. And the oscillating hotspots occur throughout California in the Northeast, Seattle, Portland, and in Florida. Based on this, I started looking deeper into our strikes and I began to collect and map out strikes by type, by location, 
and share this information for rail safe outreach opportunities. Just as I map out crimes, I map out strikes in specific regions and then find the hotspots. The California Bay Area is our number one strike location, and this is a consistent hotspot over many years. Using GIS technology, I could narrow it down to a specific, well, to specific locations within the Bay Area and then analyze it with cultural aspects. The hotspots areas within this region do seem to correlate with homeless encampments in the area. The homeless encampments are the red dots. They also correlate with lower income areas shown in beige and with predominantly Hispanic majority areas shown in green. Every city and every train strike location is unique though. There might be a reason that a location becomes a train strike train strike hotspot, and I continue to identify these areas. Diving deeper into detail, I point out very specific location within smaller geographical areas and make strong recommendations of change and community involvement. When examining, oh, I'm sorry, here's a, these are more um, uh, deep, deep dives into specific locations around the um, California area. When examining suicide strikes exclusively, I find that they too have a pattern across the country. And if there is a pattern, we can also intervene much like we do for crime. At Amtrak, we have a team of employees that lead the effort for rail safety. Barb Petito is a fantastic leader in this effort and she works hard with other railroads to post suicide signs throughout the US. She works with me to find the best locations to place the signs. In California, this map represents the suicide sign locations placed back in June 2017. In the Northeast, during the same time frame, suicide signs were also placed according to past suicide strike locations. And finally, in the Southeast, many suicide signs were placed in Florida. And after a year passed, I calculated progress with the maps on the following slides. <clears throat> so in the California area, the following year, there was a 43% reduction in suicide strikes in the regions where suicide signs were placed. For this presentation, I calculated the percent change in the same area of the same signs and found that California had a 33% reduction from the pre-suicide sign time period and then an 81% reduction for June 2019 to June 2020. And in the Northeast, the first year after the signs were posted, there was a 57% reduction in suicide strikes. I calculated the following two years and this area continues to show a reduction of suicide strikes. These maps were created to prove that suicide signs do in fact make a difference. And we hope to encourage the continual effort to intervene in suicide strikes in the future. Since this time period, Amtrak has created and posted over 300 suicide signs across the country. These efforts have not slowed down and Amtrak continues to pay for suicide prevention signs to this day. Our group continues to improve our efforts into strike data analysis. Our strike data has many components that enable our team to analyze patterns. For each strike, we keep track of train numbers, routes, delay times, vict victim gender, age, and strike type. We track a multitude of reasons why the strike may have occurred, including headphone usage, alcohol or drug usage, uh, nearby warning indicators, distracted by electronics, physically disabled, or if the trespassers went around activated gates, and many more. I add this rich data into ESRI's operational dashboard. And with this dashboard, data analytics can be performed quickly and with every single attribute and for any specific region in this company, in this country. Thank you for watching my presentation um, and please be safe and have a great day. Thank you, Michelle. It's very impressive to see what um, using technology can do for a reduction. Um, when you look at reduction rates as high as 8 plus percent in certain areas, 
uh, you can clearly see that the technology does pay off. I would add that FRA itself is using the GIS technology that Michelle mentioned, and we have developed a casualty map that you'll also find online. Um, I've also had posted online, some folks have asked it where we, we locate our data in reference to trespassing and suicide, and FRA has created the trespassing uh, dashboard, which includes our suicide data and each state um, that has uh, suicide information in it. In closing, I'd just like to say, as Mayor Rodney Craig stated earlier, we kind of want to bring this to a county level. We want to bring it home. Um, the FRA, we're all over the country. We focus on national, national um, type uh, products. However, one thing that we're going to start doing over the course of the next year, or we should have done it this year, but due, due to the uh, public health emergency, we had to postpone it, is FRA will be bringing at a county level us along with several of our key stakeholders, um, we wanna continue this conversation. Um, this group has started the conversation. We wanna continue it um, with them. So coming next year, um, we're shooting for early spring, we're gonna be teaming up with members of Cook County government, uh, Illinois Department of Transportation, the railroads in the area to host a trespassing summit. Um, in Chicago, um, most likely it will be virtual. We'll have to play that out. However, for those listening across the nation, we will be bringing this on the road. We are intending to bring this summit to several locations throughout the United States. If we are unable to do it in person, then we will be hosting it virtually. But as the mayor stated earlier, you know, we need to start bringing this home. Let's make it, uh, you know, on a county level. Let's focus our strategies to a particular area. And that's what FRA will intend to do over the course of the next month, uh, next year. With that being said, I'd like to thank Dr. Wilson for hosting this event. Uh, I, I think it was an excellent event, um, and I'll turn it right back over to you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you.